Welcome to the FA Football Forum. This podcast episode was from a series delivered back in 2020 to help support grassroots clubs and leagues. This was delivered on a webinar platform and therefore may not make too much sense unless you've got the documentation to hand, all of which is available within the description below. With this being delivered during lockdown, sometimes the audio quality may differ. Please bear that in mind. But as always, if you've got any questions or you've got any inquiries in particular to this episode or any other episode, please reach out to us by emailing clubsprogram at the fa.com. So we're on record now. Um, so like I say, thank you very much for what you do. Uh, what we're going to be going through today is we're going to be going through what uh, our club structures um, and we're going to touch on what are the most typical club structures that clubs are now adopting and I'll go into the reasoning behind that. Uh, we'll talk about what the positives and negatives of those are but more importantly as well what I want to do is actually track the journey of a club so uh, we've got Kevin uh, Larkins on the line so thank you very much Kevin um, who's basically going to give you their story from for a large club down in Essex um, about um, how their club has grown and also um, what structures their club have adopted and why. That's then going to be followed by John Devine, um, who's a partner and he's our technical expert in this area from Muckle LLP up there in Newcastle. And John will basically be going through uh, some of the detail of the benefits of certain types of club structure. Uh, we're going to touch on charities and community amateur sports clubs, which are also known as CASCs, um, and just a fraction on gift aid. Now, this is a really complex area, so what I propose we're going to do is basically focus on club structures, the benefits of charities and CASCs, and then what we'll do is we'll run a separate WebEx specifically on gift aid for those that are existing charities or CASCs, but then also those that are potentially wanting um, to gain such benefits as mandatory rate relief and gift aid from being a cask or a charity. So we'll do that um, in the future. And what we're proposing to do is almost have these as monthly WebExes based on any topics that you feel are really important to you. Um, I'm just going to just give you a bit of background. Um, I'm Mick Bakey, by the way. I'm the Senior Leagues and Club Services Manager at the FA. And like I say, what we'll do is after each session, so after Kevin's session and then after John's session, what we'll do is if anybody has any questions, please do raise your hand and then we'll come and ask questions. We'll also have a, a questions and answer session at the end uh, in there, but then we're also going to be offering a service that clubs, as pilot clubs, can actually access um, as part of the program to get a legal health check done um, through Muckle LLP. And that will basically create a report for you in terms of the key legal areas um, that uh, we, we believe um, are, are important to clubs and to look to safeguard yourselves um, on that. So moving forward, I just wanted to share with you our vision at the FA. And this is really around having leagues and clubs that are safe um, and inclusive for all. Um, what, what's really, really important um, in relation to this is the fact that our club landscape has actually changed. So we're actually having a less, less, less number of clubs each season now, but actually our clubs are getting bigger. So I'm sure you've seen around your area and the clubs that you run, the clubs are getting bigger and actually the services that you need are actually different and actually more specialist in a lot of areas. Um, a lot of you are now basically running as small businesses so what we're wanting to do is actually look to how we can support you as small businesses um, and actually sort of like help you uh, with running your club in actually being uh, fit for purpose and, and actually that will help us grain, uh, grow and retain participants within the game. Um, and actually also sort of like try and help yourselves in actually running those clubs uh, within that. As you can see, we, we do have um, around 20,000 clubs uh, in the country that run around 90,000 teams and the, the average charter standard club now has nine teams whereas the, the, the average community club has 26 teams so these are now really big organisations and what we want to do is actually look at how we can support you and certainly when we asked uh, previously about what the areas of 
you required are, um, fell into numerous brackets. One of them was coaching. Um, so what we're doing with all our pilot clubs is actually offering you additional coach mentor support if you haven't got that or haven't had that in the, in the past. Or if you have, it will be additional. Um, but also creating a coaching plan with you. So that will be through the county FA and your coach mentors to actually give you additional support and resource in that area. Another area that quite rightly a lot of clubs are asking um, for support on is their facilities. And across the country we're currently writing local football facility plans. And again, as pilot clubs, what we will do is ensure that you're involved in the consultation um, of those plans. And again, this will be led um, through your county FA uh, with the regional uh, facilities officers that we have for the FA and through the Football Foundation. Um, but what we want to focus on tonight, as I said, is um, the club structures. And my last slide really, just sort of like introduce that, is just really just to explain the impact that Charter Standard has had. Um, since it was introduced in 2001, uh, we now have over 80% of all youth teams and around 40% of all adult teams are actually in clubs now that are Charter Standard. And it's been um, a, a great success, but a real testament to your work and your commitment to actually implementing the Chart Standard Programme that has allowed this to happen. And so what we're wanting to do is actually reflect where our clubs are now in relation to the Charter Standard Framework. And a lot of our clubs now have actually outgrown it. And when I go, we, we, have, team, we have clubs now with 90 teams, with 80 teams, with 70 teams. And quite rightly, they're saying, actually, we've outgrown the framework and we need to refine the, the, uh, the framework. So that is what we're doing. And we will look to change that in season 2021. And it's not just for the big clubs, but actually for everybody. So you may be aware that, you know, in order to get every team, every youth team with a qualified coach, we're actually investing uh, 1.2 million this year and over the next two seasons, following two seasons, to support um, all youth teams to have a qualified coach. Um, but also look at a whole series of different services that we can provide. And this is really uh, the start of that as a pilot. So again, you know, thank you for being involved in this. And we want your feedback in how useful you actually feel these kind of sessions are, and also how we can then cascade this out to others who could also benefit from that. So that's enough from me for now. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass you over to Kevin uh, Larkins, who's from Hutton FC, and Kevin's just going to basically take you through their journey. Um, so, Kevin, I'll pass over to you, and I'll move the slides. So, whenever you want me to move the slides, just let me know. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me, Mick? <coughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. Everyone can hear you. Good. Lovely. Uh, okay, um, make sure you kind of uh, cut me short if I'm waffling on too much. So, uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> yeah, thanks. Cheers. Good evening, everybody. Yeah, uh, just a quick introduction. My name's Kevin Lawkins, Club Development Officer for Hutton Football Club. Uh, the club's a Charter Standard Community Club based to the east of Brentwood in Essex. We've got over 60 teams at the club, male and female, both with youngest age groups up to and including senior teams. So that, that, that's us. Um, now, just about our journey on club structures. Um, the growth of the club, like a number of clubs out there, I'm sure, has accelerated over the last 10 years and is now stabilising at the level it is today. After 20 years of trying, we have also managed to find a site where we could build a home for our members and have been granted planning permission. Um, so with, with such huge changes taking place, we felt we needed to take a fresh look how we are going to continue to run the club, in particular with the potential increase in liability for our officers. So limiting that liability became a priority. That's where we sort of came at this from. So I attended a number of presentations, both from the FA and from Sports England, on club structures and the benefits of incorporation. And the club had been considering this for the past five to six years with growing interest. First of all, it was an interesting subject to us, nothing more, nothing less. But as time went on, uh, we saw the, the importance of uh, going down this route. Can you move me on, please, Mick? Absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, right, so 
Oh, we've gone one step too far. Have you got got a previous slide on that or not? Okay. We'll, 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 we'll go with the previous slide, Mick. Just go back one, sorry. Yeah. Um, so three years ago, we made the decision to set up a, a HSC Holdings, which was a company limited by guarantee to take on the new the lease for the new ground. Um, the intention being that the club will come under this vehicle in time. The reason we chose to go that route was at the time uh, we felt that charities had the reputation of being overly complex and intrusive on the running of the club. At least that's what we were told, not by the FA, but other people told us that was the, uh, the case. Uh, so we went down the company limited by guarantee route. Over the next 12 months, after more con consultation and research, it became apparent that the issues around incorporating as a charity were not as difficult as we assumed. So we felt incorporating the football club as a charity held advantages for us, uh, charity being more suited to a non-profit organisation. Charity Sorry, has better... Kevin. Sorry, Sorry, Kevin. Is that the slide you want? That's the one. There you go. Thank you very much. <laughs> right, thanks. Um, yeah, the uh, charity has a better reputation with its with funders and supporters, uh, has simpler reporting requirements, and all with the same tax advantages. Um, obviously, the, the the issue about the reputation of charity has probably been tarnished a little bit late, but uh, I don't really think that's changed overly. So, so now we were in a situation where we had a limited company by guarantee holding the lease. And the football club was a charity. Um, we weren't quite sure about how all this was linked together. Also, only great in principle. We've got these great new sort of uh, little organisations around the club. But how did that all link up? So naturally, I picked the phone up to Mick and said, uh, "We need some help on this because I've done all this. We've incorporated, but we're not quite sure where this has left us." So um, that's what I did, and Mick put us in touch with uh, John at Muckles. And uh, John sat down with us and, um, and we worked on how our structure should look based on what we were trying to achieve and the vehicles that we'd set up at present. So um, we added to that a trading company um, where the sort of bar and the cafe operate out of um, and sort of formed uh, that, that vehicle. Uh, also at this point, John, John pointed out to us, which is I think interesting to note, because I know a few people that haven't done this, that uh, what you needed to do is a proper transfer of assets from your existing uh, organization into the new organization. So John also set that up for us as well. Can you move on, please, Mick? Thanks. Is that where you want to go to? Yeah, that's it. That's great. Thank you. Um, I would just say at this point that all clubs are different, as you know, um, and although this is the route we chose, I'm sure you know, you're going to have other priorities and different ways of looking at it. So this is our sort of current structure. You can see the, the charity at the top. Um, underneath that, the holdings company and the trading company. Uh, all the items below that sort of just represent now how we how we run the club. Uh, the top is the corporate structure. Um, so in terms of the tax advantage, which I haven't mentioned, of course, Mick's already mentioned the, the relief on business rates. Um, gift aid, where 25p in the pound on donations. Um, so for example, if we wanted, just, just an example really, if, if we wanted to raise 50,000 on donations for the new ground, we could potentially claim back another 12,500 pounds, which would be uh, of great use to us. On VAT, we're looking at some partial VAT recovery on new ground costs of 25 to 30%, which is also going to be worth about 40 to 50,000 pounds to us. Um, there are, it's not just advantages in terms of building facilities, although it clearly has an advantage. There are, obviously, you can continue to claim back on donations, etc., which Mick already touched on. Um, so if you just move us on again, Mick, please. Thank you. So, so what's next for us, really? Um, so we we signed off our documents. Um, the other issue we've got now is we set about trying to change the bank accounts because obviously you need to change them over into uh, a charity bank account. 
I would say that's probably been the most uh, time consuming part of the equation. It's taken six months and we're just about to get the new accounts open this week. Um, but uh, nevertheless, so, so if you're going to do that, make sure you sort of get started on that process early, I would say. Um, so until you change your bank accounts, of course, you can't set up or, um, for gift aid or register for VAT. So once we've got the bank accounts in place, that's our next step. Having set up the corporate structure and other associated issues, we, we again look to see how we actually manage the club. Uh, the board of trustees obviously run the charity. Uh, those trustees together with the club, club personnel are formed the executive committee, which has replaced the management committee. So again, we found ourselves, this whole structure and process was evolving sort of almost in front of our eyes. So um, what we've got to do now is look to see how we vote in those trustees and directors. Uh, the way we've set it up at the moment is the trustees and directors are there for a three or four year term. So that may not be satisfactory going forward and you may need to stagger those. So we need to look at that. Um, and also on our membership criteria now too. Fortunately, we've got some in-house expertise, which we're happy to share with everybody once that's sorted, um, working on that process. So over this period under review, um, our priorities have changed as a club. Uh, the issue of facilities, incorporation, and what our, want, our volunteers want to get involved with. I'm sure every club has those kind of issues with volunteers. Um, it's not the same as it used to be, and what volunteers are willing to get involved in is not what they wanted to get involved in the, in the past, particularly as the club has grown so large. Um, finances clearly have to be a, a greater focus uh, with more expertise in place. Now you're an incorporated incorpor entity. Uh, coaching and development has become a club priority for us. Um, and the, obviously the management of our teams and our football sections, which have grown. Um, so I would say in, in sort of summary that um, the process has been relatively straightforward, actually. It sounds uh, complex, but it, but it's not when, when it's broken down. Um, and there are some clear advance, advantages to clubs. Um, our benefit one benefit we did not expect was the reappraisal of where the club is is now and what the run structure should look like. So literally, are there better ways of resources and managing? If we'd have carried on as we were, we'd have just probably kept on doing the same thing. Um, I would say, obviously, anyone going down this route uh, needs to have advice on all legal and, and tax aspects because um, you know, none of us can be... Um, have expert expertise in that field. Um, that's that's broadly it from me, Mick. That's great. Thank you very much indeed. Um, really informative. Really brings it to life in terms of um, you know why you. So can you just explain again, sort of like why you, you felt in terms of the protection of the volunteers was important? Um, really, because the. You know the, the liabilities involved in in a in a club ordinary. I mean, we've all got insurance, but that doesn't necessarily cover us for everything. So, um, and that's mainly sort of personal liability. But uh, okay. you know, certainly taking on facilities, the the level of liabilities that are likely to accrue to uh, officers of the club are, are yeah. enormous, sort of exponential, really. So yeah. that, that really we had to look after the the members of the club. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. Um, really appreciate that, Kevin. Um, does anybody have any questions before we go to John? Um, if you have any questions, you just want to raise your hand? No? Excellent. Well, thank you very much again, Kevin. Much appreciated. And stay on the line because I'm sure there might be some questions at the end as well um, yeah, when John moves through here. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, so I'll now move you on to John Devine, who's, um, like I say, a partner at Muckle LLP. And they're a company that we commission as the Football Association uh, to provide the free legal helpline that we have for clubs. Um, hopefully you're aware of that. Um, but also sort of like a specialist in this area and, and have supported numerous clubs down this route now. 
So what we felt we'd do is sort of like just run over, not go into all the detail, but sort of like just a, a brief overview because you will have an opportunity if you really want to go down this route to have um, a one-to-one -one consultation with John and the, and the, uh, the specialists at Muckle LLP. So, John, are you there? John, can you hear me now? Yeah. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Thank you yeah, very great. much, Steve. So, Hi. John, I'll pass you on to your first your first slide. Great. Thanks very much. Uh, evening, everyone. Um, I'm, as Mick said, I'm John Devine. I head the sports team at Muckle, and uh, we've worked with the FA for almost eight years now on the uh, FA Charter Standard and um, related support for the for the leagues as well. Uh, many of which take a, as you can imagine, probably take a, a variety of different forms. I know I've, we've worked with uh, with some of you who are on the call uh, this evening. It was good to, to hear Kevin's um, input on uh, the, the experience that they have because it's 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 pretty much something that we come across a lot in terms of um, the uh, the different types of structure. A lot of uh, clubs do form initially as um, unincorporated associations, which are essentially a a members club, you know, a group of individuals who are coming together for a common purpose. Um, but over time, they do evolve, and then it's important to kind of ensure that that legal structure, um, you know, keeps pace with uh, the organisation itself. So what we're going to look at this evening is uh, three distinct things: um, the traditional unincorporated association model, uh, and when that can still be fit for purpose. Um, the alternative, which would be traditionally to look at a company limited by guarantee, which is the most commonly used form of incorporated legal structure for a club to adopt whether or not it wants to go for a special tax status. The last one of being, um, I always talk in terms of structure and then tax status because they're two distinct things other than in relation to CIOs, which I'll touch on in a sec. So um, you've got, you, the, the transition is essentially going from your unincorporated association to a company, usually limited by guarantee. And then in that, that new vehicle, you then need to decide whether you have any Special, you want to go for special tax status, which is either charity or community at the sports club, um, with, with CASC, uh, which obviously the regulations changed in 2015. So we'll go through each of those and just do a little comparison of each and, and look at the triggers as to why you would want to look at it. So, Mick, can you move to the next slide, please? Thank you. So, just looking at unincorporated associations, to be honest, the vast majority of football clubs who are formed in England will be unincorporated association clubs. They are essentially entities that have no legal personality in their own right. They, 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 can't, own, uh, they can't own land in their own name. Trust, they, essentially, the management committee has to do that on, on their behalf. They can't enter into contracts. They can't employ staff. Uh, all of that has to be done by the management committee uh, for the time being um, of that unincorporated association. They operate for the benefit of uh, the members. And uh, as I said before, the traditional uh, definition is an organization of two or more persons who are members who agree to cooperate in further in a common purpose. So it's a very traditional format for a lot of um, uh, leisure-oriented uh, groups as well as, um, as, as sports participation-based clubs. They don't have a principal regulator. So if you're a charity, you're regulated by the Charity Commission. If you're a company, you're regulated by Company House. Unincorporated associations don't have any principal regulator at all, um, largely because usually the income that comes through these ent the entities is so small that they, they don't actually register uh, for uh, with, with any principal regulator other than HMRC would probably be the only one uh, depending on the levels of income that come through it. As I said before, they don't have a separate legal personality. So you have issues in relation to contracts or interests in land that have been taken by the club you know, from time to time, usually then the name of the management committee members. So particularly for succession planning, that can cause a few problems if people either um, pass on or, uh, or um, leave the organization in, uh, in uh, over a course of time, how do you actually hold um, that, in, that interest? Strictly speaking, it should be transferred from committee to committee in terms of the membership. That doesn't tend to happen in practice. We come across a lot where we look into the, uh, by way of due diligence on the club, looking into kind of how it's been structured and the types of things that it's got involved in. And sometimes they haven't, um, the legal documentation hasn't kept pace with the organization perhaps on the field. Um, so it's just important to bear that in mind in terms of any, if you do still have that structure. Uh, the, ma the ultimate governing body is, is typically the management committee of the club, and that can either be, um, they can be the only members, or there can be a wider associate membership, as I like to recall, uh, to, to refer to it. And that tends to be people who pay a subscription to come along and use the facilities and take part in the activities. Um, so depending on the type of organization you have, that's, that's, uh, there's two different options there. 
the governing document, typically a constitution, um, it can be um, modified by a set of rules and or bylaws as well. Uh, they tend to deal with classification, admission and um, rights and privileges attaching to membership. Um, so that, that they tend to be the suite of documents that, that uh, govern the, the club. Um, the liability for individual members of management committee is unlimited joint and several on a personal basis. So this is the probably the, the most key um, part of uh, understanding from a management committee member's point of view, uh, what the implications are of becoming treasurer, chairman, or whatever role it is that you fulfil on the management committee of a, of a club, if it is not incorporated. Essentially, if a claim is brought against uh, the unincorporated association, unincorporated association club, then if the club was unable to sustain that claim out of its assets, which would principally be cash at bank and whatever else it, it held, then the claimant could go after any one of the management committee members um, as they see fit, essentially. Um, so it means that your personal assets, family home, um, and, and other things are potentially at risk. As, as Kevin alluded to before, there is insurance to obviously protect you in certain instances, but as with any insurance policy, it's only as good as the, uh, the level of cover that you have, as well as ensuring that you haven't done anything or not done anything to invalidate the policy. So. Um, I always take the view that you're better off not being the legal entity that is pursued um, because at the end of the day, most of you guys are volunteers and do this as a, as a part-time um, role. And on that basis, it, it, I think you should do whatever you should, um, you, you consider to be appropriate essentially to ensure that you are uh, protected in your capacity as a volunteer. Uh, each ordinary member's liability is usually limited to a nominal, uh, nominal sum, usually the subscription fee, uh, whatever they've, they've uh, paid by way of subscription to be a member of the club for that year, if the club was ever uh, wound up at that point. Uh, next slide, please, Mick. So, is it, uh, when, when can clubs adopt it? I think it's still suitable for small members and amateur clubs. You know, where you're talking a handful of teams where it's a collection of individuals who just want to represent a group uh, within a local area. Um, they don't employ staff, they don't have a, a pitch that is, is theirs, they would tend to hire a pitch from a local authority or another another provider um, and you know they don't end into any contracts other than you know, obviously the uh, the representation uh, and registration contracts with the the, you know, the league you know for uh, by way of forms I mean you know to, to participate in in the league. Um, it's entirely done on an amateur basis and on, on that basis it's, it's still okay to uh, to operate. In terms of succession planning I, I, I alluded to that uh, just before it can cause issues when people um, tend, to, tend to move on, and if they've entered into contracts for and on behalf of the, uh, the club, then essentially those contracts should be assigned and evaded to the continuing management committee members. So that type of issue uh, is, is more problematic with an unincorporated association club. And I would say consider the size of undertaking that you have, the number of teams that you operate, because essentially, as we'll touch on just with the next slide, please, Mick, um, there are a number of questions that you can essentially ask yourself as, as to whether or not you um, need to move or consider moving to a different type of legal structure. And these are the main ones. These are the main triggers that we always go through with clubs. If you employ staff, if you have an interest in property, be it freehold, leasehold, or um, your long license you know, of, of a, of a uh, property which essentially is yours to manage and operate, um, a lease is you have, tend to have to have exclusive possession for a lease, whether, whereas a license might be uh, something that you share a ground with another club or clubs. Um, do you enter into contracts or other arrangements involving risk? And are you looking to develop uh, facilities, which is one of the things that Kevin touched on before, because you're always looking at risk, and with, with risk obviously comes liability and the potential of personal liability if you're not incorporated. So they're the main triggers as to why you would consider um, you're looking at changing your legal structure in the first instance. And then if you are going to change it, um, it's often uh, more cost effective to look at tax status at the same time as well, um, because otherwise you have to do a two stage process in terms of uh, changing your governing document. Next one, please, Mick. So the, the, the traditional option that a lot of clubs take, uh, if they're not quite sure whether they want to go for a special tax status like CASC or charity as yet, is if they are minded to proceed on the basis of, well, we don't want to be personally on the hook as management committee members if anything you know, um, were to happen uh, that none of us can foresee and um, you know, a claim was going to be brought by a third party against the club. How can we protect ourselves? The obvious way is to become a company limited by guarantee. Uh, they are traditionally asset locked, which means that uh, the members don't participate in the assets on winding up unless the, the governing document expressly permits it, uh, which you can only do in relation to ones that don't have CASCO uh, or charity status. 
Um, and you would look at, in terms of the, the, the characteristics that come with it, um, it has a separate legal personality, so it can enter into contracts in its own name, the legal name of the, of the company. It can employ staff. It can hold interest in property. Trustees can come and go. Um, directors can come and go in relation to the um, uh, the management of uh, the of the, the company. All interests essentially remain with the company until it's formally wound up and resolved. So it has that advantage of permanence. It will stay on the register until it's formally removed um, by the registrar of companies or by the members making an election to uh, to remove it voluntarily. Your governing document um, tends to be articles of association if you've incorporated post October 2009. Before then, uh, you might have had a memorandum and articles of association, but by operation of law in October 2009, when the Section 28 of the Companies Act, which I've just referred to there, came in, it, con it operated to the effect that everything that was in the memorandum was deemed by operation of law to be consolidated into the articles. So going forward, if you incorporate these days or you're changing your articles in relation to an older set of articles, that's pre-2009, you'll tend to have one set of, of articles as the governing documents rather than memorandum and articles. The memorandum is essentially blank and it's a matter of uh, record as to who the original subscribers were. As I touched on there before, you do have an asset lock, um, so it means that the assets can't be distributed amongst the members after be given usually to another organisation that carries on same or similar objects. And you do have specific purposes which are largely to, to take part in am amateur sport. Next slide, please, Mick. <coughs> Thank you. So um, incorporated club officers are the directors. Um, if you have charitable status, uh, the directors would also be the trustees that would perform a dual role uh, in that capacity. So just to draw that distinction, they would tend to be protected by an indemnity in the governing document, uh, the articles itself, uh, which uh, says anything essentially that you do in the ordinary course of business, provided that you haven't, operate, you haven't operated recklessly or fraudulently in the way that you've, you've carried on your, the discharge of duties, you would tend to be protected by an indemnity uh, from the company. An indemnity essentially is a contractual promise to make good any loss that you suffer on a personal basis out of the assets of the company. So if anything were to attach to you personally in relation to something that you'd done um, in good faith, you know, in, in discharge of your duties, then um, you could be indemnified out of the assets of uh, the company in that respect. Obviously, an indemnity is only as good as the solvency of the, the, the organization that gives it. So it's important to make sure that you're, you're, you're mindful of um, the the financial uh, situation of the, of the club. And I always say as well, don't assume blanket immunity because you've got an indemnity because it doesn't protect you in the case of wrongful trading where you ought to have known that the company couldn't pay its steps as they fall due or fraud in trading where you definitely did know that um, you know, there was there's credit issues and you were still racking up um, uh, bills on, on the club's uh, behalf. In terms of legal membership, uh, the, the legal members, their li liability is limited to a nominal sum, usually a pound or 10 pounds. Uh, and as I said before, they can't participate in the assets on winding up. You might have a wider membership, um, which I tend to refer to as being affiliate or associate members. They tend to be the, the, uh, either the, the children or, or if you had adult teams as well, um, the individuals who come, come along as the participants who pay a subscription every year to take part in your activities. Um, they tend not to have voting rights under company law, um, but you can confer rights under them under a separate set of rules and bylaws uh, from time to time, which tends to deal with things like um, election to the to the board of directors. You don't have to have a company secretary, um, but there are certain company secretarial functions that you would usually have to undertake if you don't have one. Uh, they would be filing your accounts at company's house and filing your confirmation statement every year at company's house. If you if you have charitable status as well, you would also have to file an annual return to the charity commission as well as uh, a um, set of accounts in, in, uh, in compliant format with the charity commission as well, but it is technically the same set of accounts. The board, the board essentially is strategic in nature, so they deal with um, decision making and management. And you have to comply with the Companies Act 2006 if you are limited by a guarantee with no special status. If you're a charity as well, then you have to comply with the Charities Act 2011, um, and they rather helpfully consolidated uh, legislation for the last three Charities Acts into one. Um, so that's it's quite succinct to refer back to. Decisions are reserved, that are reserved to legal members tend to be things, it's the major stuff like changing your articles, uh, changing your voting rights, changing your name, um, removing directors, they tend to be reserved to the members rather than to the, uh, to the board. Um, so it's only uh, in that capacity as legal uh, members. Other alternative uh, options for incorporation, company limited by shares, um, but that is potentially predicated on the basis of, of profit, largely profit making. 
um, principles because they do trade with a view to profit and essentially in terms of drawing a parallel with companies owned by guarantee, a shareholder um, who is the equivalent of a legal member in a um, company limited by guarantee for um, company law purposes tends to have three votes, uh, sorry, three rights. Um, the right to vote, the right to receive a dividend um, if it's declared out of the taxable profits of, uh, of the company and the right to participate in its assets on winding up. So if it's ever wound up or it's sold on, a shareholder would tend to receive remuneration for um, out of the, the company itself on winding up or from a third party if it was sold um, to a different organisation, which is why obviously professional clubs are, are structured in that way. It tends not to uh, to, uh, to be of relevance to most clubs operating in you know in the steps below the football league pyramid. Uh, it, the higher on you go, it do, the, you, you do see a change from guarantee into share status, though, because essentially they become more profit making in orientation. Um, in terms of the objects, just going back to the top there, they tend to have just general com commercial objects, so to carry on business as a commercial company, which means you can pretty much do anything uh, within reason. And um, whereas companies done by guarantee have to have defined objects, you know, to promote amateur sport tends to be the tr uh, traditional one. Next one, please, Mick. So just uh, highlight on there uh, by way of uh, a reference guide. And if you go on our website, on the FA page of our website, there is a full a uh, breakdown by way of comparisons of the different types of legal structure you can be, as well as uh, different tax status. Uh, it's on the FA page, which I'm happy to circulate after this. But just to give you an idea there of drawing a comparison, the first two columns, I would say, are legal structure. The last is um, special tax status, and that refers to charity. Other than you can have a legal structure, which is charitable only, which is a charitable incorporated organization. It only came in the last, in the last uh, few Yes, um, charities build 2013, I think it was. So they started coming in, in um, in frequency. I think uh, probably in in about 2015, uh, when when new organisations were tending to look at that as an alternative to a company limited by guarantee with charitable status. So this table here just gives you a comparison of the different types of entity you can be: an incorporated association, limited company, and if you're a charity, you've got four choices: either association, charitable trust, limited company, or CIO. Um, it'll give you a comparison there of the types of entity it's formed to be, as well as your third party regulators, who your management of, of, of the association is and what your governing document is. Um, I'd encourage you to have a look at the one that's on the website because that goes into more detail as to the can you, can't you questions in relation to can you pay players and other things. Next slide, please, Mick. So once you've uh, incorporated, to usually to limit the liability of the trustees and to um, give your organisation permanence so that it can stay on the register until it's formally wound up and it can hold interest in property and, and employ staff, the things that I've talked about before, should you consider a special tax status, um, it's usually quicker and cheaper um, to consider that this, at the same time as incorporating because otherwise you have a two-stage two process. The two options you've really got are um, charity or CASC. Um, charity, you're registered voluntarily with the Charity Commission and you, would, you register separately with HMRC for gift aid and tax purposes. With a CASC, you're registered only with HMRC, um, so it's a status that's conferred by uh, the tax authorities rather than any other independent regulator. Next one, please, Mick. So CIO we touched on before. Um, it's the legal entity that Kevin uh, at Hutton um, elected to uh, to run with, and um, it's essentially it's becoming more... Um, widely used by uh, organizations just generally within the, the charity sector as well as clubs operating at grassroots level um, because you essentially have you have two options in, in relation to yeah, the type of CIO you can be um, either a foundation model where it's trustee controlled uh, or association model where you essentially have a, a wider associate membership where it's one member one vote the latter tend to be a lot more difficult to administer um, on a, on a general basis because you have a far more uh, a far greater number of members to consult in relation to decision making so the former is really uh, adopted where the trustees perform a rule essentially as the custodians of the club so they will take the legal interests and management and strategic direction of the uh, of the of the charity uh, in their hands essentially having been elected to be there in the first place from the wider membership so foundation model tends to be the more common one in relation to uh, to amateur clubs that we see. The distinction with companies limited by guarantee is that you're regulated by the Charity Commission only. So if you're a company limited by guarantee that has charitable status, you've got two regulators, the Commission and Companies House. 
With a CIO, you're only regulated by the Charity Commission. There is an income test um, if you apply to be a company by guarantee with charitable status with the Charity Commission. There is no income test if you elect to become a CIO. So you, what you do essentially do is you settle your constitution, you apply for charitable status, and then subject to uh, the vetting of the application by the Commission, when uh, they consider you to be uh, have met the required uh, eligibility criteria, they will admit you to the register. Then the CIO will exist in law, um, you know, for the purposes of, uh, of being able to do the things we've, we've talked about to date in terms of third-party interests. The crucial thing is that you don't have to meet an income threshold um, to register a CIO, and that, that's the distinction I'd raise between the two. Next one, Mick, please. So timing. As I said there, it won't exist until it's formally registered by the Commission, so you can't enter into contracts, you can't do anything essentially as a CIO until you're formally admitted to the register. So the, the issue that this um, often raises is with a company you can set it up usually within a matter of days. Um, so once you've settled your form of articles, which you would do with assistance from a, 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 from a solicitor or if you want to do your own, there are, there are standard formats you can do, uh, adopt. It takes a couple of days essentially to register a company at a company's house. Um, you're then looking at, with current time frames, 12 to 18 weeks to register with the Charity Commission from the date of submission of the application. So there's a, there's a timing issue. Obviously, the company exists in law as soon as it's registered at a company's house. So you can then start to do prep work with um, taking interest in the company's name as well as opening a bank account subject to the award of charitable status. You can't do any of that with a CIO until it's formally registered. You have to wait, essentially, until the Commission have approved it, and only then can you start doing those things. In terms of deregistration, um, you can um, deregister with, it, with the, uh, the Commission, but if you do, obviously, you have to cease to exist, whereas you can deregister a company with charitable status with the Charity Commission and just become a normal company limited by guarantee. If you cease to exist, if you deregister with a CIO, you basically have to transfer your assets to something else because a CIO can't be anything other than a charity. There's a comparative, I would say, lack of public information uh, with uh, companies limited by guarantee. The relatively, companies limited by guarantee are relatively easy to search against. Yeah, you can find out who the directors are and you can see the filed accounts. You can see charges that have been um, entered on the company's uh, house register. With this, and, and you can also see the, the governing documents, essentially the articles of association when that's been changed. With a CIO, essentially all you'll see are who the trustees are in terms of a list of those trustees and when it was registered and the filed accounts, that's it. Nothing else is available uh, publicly in relation to a CIO. So there is a lack of public information. That's why third parties like banks um, tend to be uh, take a bit more time in terms of, I think, setting up and dealing with them uh, on that basis, um, particularly because on a lending basis. Um, in terms of comparative familiarity, I would say company limited by guarantee is still the more traditional model um, because it's it has it's been long, around longer and is more widely known and more widely recognised by by third parties. Um, but essentially, you have two options now uh, whether you wish to incorporate. There's a limited scope of activities uh, that you can undertake, obviously through a CIO because it's it does have um, charitable status. And you've obviously got to be mindful of of what um, your charitable status uh, is whenever you're undertaking any any uh, decision making on behalf of the charity. I always say as a rule of thumb as a trustee. <coughs> Ask yourself, is it in the best interest of the charity? Uh, does it further the objects, which have to be wholly and exclusively charitable? Um, have you got the power to do it? And have you managed any conflicts? If you do those four things, you'll not go too far wrong. Next one, please, Mick. So benefits of charitable status. Essentially, these six are the main ones that I'd always pick out in terms of why you would want to consider charitable status in the first place. Public perception, because um, the, people understand what charities are. They know that you're continually regulated from the point of registration. You've got tax effective contributions through the gift aid scheme, individual and corporate. And um, obviously, charities can receive legacies. Gifts to charities are, are free of inheritance tax um, for, you know, for, for the purposes of, um, of leaving gifts in your will. You get an automatic uh, mandatory 80% discount on non domestic business rates in relation to property that you occupy, wholly or mainly in furtherance of your charitable objects. Uh, you can apply for the additional 20% discretionary, but that depends on. The, uh, the local authority because it's entirely up to them whether they issue it or not. You've got, I think, greater accessibility to grant funding. Um, some grant funders will only fund registered charities. If you haven't got charitable status, no matter how well-meaning the, um, uh, the purpose or uh, what the club does in the community, they will not be able to fund you unless you have a registered um, special status like charity or cask. And I think with commercial partners, it gives you two options. You can either go down uh, the corporate gift aid route, which is 
essentially them making a, a corporate gift out of their taxable profits where, on which they'll claim corporation tax relief. And, and you can acknowledge that, but only only make a mere acknowledgement. Or if they definitely, uh, if the, the alternative is to say when you have the conversation with them is to say, well, we do want some branding out of this. We do want recognition of how our um, brand works in association with your club. Uh, they might want branded bibs, branded uh, shirts. Uh, they might want use of the facilities. Any of those things, if it's a package, it's usually sponsorship, and that changes the tax treatment materially. So you should take advice on that. We do have a note um, on the, the, the website to that effect. Um, VAT reliefs is the last one. There are certain VAT reliefs and exemptions that are only available to um, charities and not to CASCs or any uh, entity that doesn't have special tax status. Next one, Mick, please. So CASCs, by way of comparison, I would describe as being charity light. You get some, but not all the benefits of being a, a registered charity. The main ones being tax effective contributions, both individual and corporate, um, and by way of donations and rate relief on charity pro on cask property. You do get an element of accessibility to grant funding as well, but um, as I said before, some will only fund other charities, so uh, that, that would depend entirely on the grant fund and what their grant making policy is. Next one, please. So just a brief. Uh, overview of gift aid there is no minimum limit in the uk uh, you're free of inheritance tax capital gains tax and income tax on gifts you make to charity individual donors uh, donors have to be uk taxpayers and they have to have paid an equivalent amount of tax in the same tax year in which the donations are made from uh, 6th april 2012. So you'll often see that gift aid symbol on uh, charity envelopes if you go to a fundraising dinner and um you can uh, it, what you tend to have to, to, to see is people are asked to put in a a nominal sum of um, you know ten pounds, twenty pounds per person. Um, obviously, for every pound that's donated, the charity's reclaiming an extra twenty-five p in gift aid. So on a tenner, it's worth twelve pound fifty. On on twenty pounds, it's worth twenty-five. Sorry, on twenty pounds, it's worth twenty-five. And so if you multiply that by the number of people in the room, sometimes it can be forty plus tables in a room. If you've got um, you know that level of contribution on a uh, on a ten pound one it's an extra thousand pounds on on a, a twenty pound one it's an extra two thousand pounds so it's it really adds up in terms of um the levels of income that you can generate from um uh, from uh, those dinners if you've got a sizable um you know number of attendees next one please Mick. yeah so corporate donations i'll just distinguish these two they work differently to individual donations so essentially as a charity all you do is bank the check and say thanks very much there's nothing uh, more to um uh, to reclaim the benefit is to the corporate donor uh, out of their taxable profits so if they make a million pounds profit and give a hundred grand away over the course of the year to charity they'll only co pay corporation tax on the nine thousand residual balance that remains after it. so it's essentially it's deducted its source before they get assessed for corporation tax so the incentive to them is for you to say well had you kept that hundred grand that ten grand or whatever you would have to pay 90, uh, currently 19% of it is to HMRC anyway, so it's only costing you 8,100 to put in 10 grand over the course of the year, 81,000 to put in 100 grand. So with, with large numbers, it, it, it works very well in terms of incentivizing what, um, how far that money can go. Um, essentially, there's nothing for you to reclaim, no 25p per pound, you just bank the check, say thanks very much, that's all. Um, with individual donations, you do have to reclaim the extra 25 pence uh, per pound donation. In most people's cases, what you're doing is you're, you're reclaiming base rate income tax that's been deducted as source when people have been paid salary by their employer. So as long as they've, they've paid an equivalent amount of tax in the same year in which they make their donation, then it's fine. What's often forgot, forgotten about, though, is, is higher rate income tax relief. So if you're a 40% or a 45% taxpayer, you are entitled to claim personal tax relief um, on the difference between your top rate of tax and basic rate 20 on the gross gift, uh, which it, it can lead to a considerable uh, rebate at the end of the year when you're doing self-assessment. So again, you can incentivize uh, people to make um, uh, your donations on that basis, particularly if they're 40% or 45% taxpayers. Uh, membership fees to qualify for gift aid, um, subscription payments have to be for membership only. You can't give personal use of the charity's facilities or services, which is why in relation to sports clubs, it's often uh, the case that you're, not, you're unable to claim gift aid in relation to um, uh, members' subscriptions because by way of subscription, if you are given in return access to facilities and access to coaching, then you are getting something back for the making of that contribution. That applies to adults as well as to children because because if you're uh, donating on behalf on behalf if, sorry if you're subscribing on behalf of a child or donating on behalf of a child, 
HMRC regards it as um, you uh, as you being one and the same person for, for, for tax purposes. So you can't give personal use of facilities um, if you are seeking to claim uh, gift aid. The alternative is to say, well, what is the uh, the subscription cost per per member, you know, for use of the facilities per year, and set that. You can then invite donations over over and above that amount, which you can claim gift aid on. So you can do that from time to time, either by way of a regular donation or by way of um, donations made at, uh, at dinners or other fundraising events. Looking at casks, can they claim gift aid on membership? Uh, no, they can't. Essentially, that is the, the short answer. Uh, members are given personal access to clubs, facilities, or services as part of their cask membership. So um, it's it's uh, it's pretty emphatically clear uh, on on that. There is an article on our website which deals with this um, as well. So just distinguish between the two. Um, and just to clarify, by way of the last point, there, gift aid can't be claimed on subscription payment, but paid on behalf of someone else. As I say, you know, in relation to. Um, um, payments made on behalf of the child or any other third party. Uh, next one, please, Mick. So trading company, uh, Hutton FC, um, as Kevin alluded to before, they, they do have one. Why do you need one? Largely because in relation to charity and uh, charity in particular, but CASC as well, because there were some restrictions that came in in 2015 with regard to CASCs, which set out how much essentially commercial trading income you could generate through uh, the parent club. Uh, in charities, it's currently 25% uh, turn of turnover up to 200 grand, subject to an overall, co overall cap of 50 grand. Um, it's going up to 80 grand in uh, the uh, in April 2019, and that brings it closer in line with uh, with VAT registration as well. Uh, with casks, the thing you've got to be wary of in terms of why you might need a trading company is uh, rental income, which is limited to 30 grand and uh, non-member income which is limited to 100 grand they tend to be the main ones as to why you would need to set up a trading company uh, for a cask in each instance it ring fences that uh, the the club's assets are on risk so you can do a lot of things through the trading company without putting the uh, the parent club at risk so you tend to do ventures or different projects through trading companies as well as commercial um, trading to keep the um, the club's assets um, separate it's relatively, they're relatively easy to, uh, and quick to incorporate uh, because the, the company is owned by shares. There's typically one share in issue, and that share is owned by the parent club. And if it's an incorporated entity like a CIO or a company owned by guarantee, it's easy for that company to own uh, the, the, the one issued share in another company. As I said, it becomes a wholly owned trading subsidiary of that, of that parent. There is a model that we prepared for Sport England, which is available on uh, Sport England's Club Matters, which takes you through um, you should you be a cask or charity, as well as do you need a trading company based on the type of activities that your club carries on on a regular basis, largely commercial in nature, goods that you buy in for the purposes of resale, or if you carry on any substantial levels of catering or bar or anything like that. Um, they, they tend to be the main ones. Next slide, please, Mick. So that's it, John. Is that, is that the last slide? Great. That's okay. the last slide. So thank you very much. Uh, have a drink. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I will do. <laughs> a lot of information there. Um, yep. And I appreciate there's lots of information um, for people to, to digest there. Um, and, and as I said, what we, what we will be doing is basically is, is offering each club to have sort of like a one-to-one -one consultation with Muckle. Um, that we'll be supporting um, through through the FA and through this program if you wish to go down that route. I know I've already had a few uh, private chats on this saying uh, a few clubs are wanting to speak to Muckle on that. But if you have any questions, and just to say, um, we will be doing a separate session on uh, CASC, Charity and Gift Day, because I think there's a lot of confusion out there um, in terms of the different advice that's given actually from HMRC depending on which regional office you're in as well. Um, yeah. So I know there's there's lots of clubs out there who are claiming elements of subscriptions um, and have that, had that approved, whereas others haven't. So what we want to do is run a session where, where basically we will look at how we can support clubs through that process. Um, does anybody have any questions? If anybody's got any questions, would you like to raise your hand? Yeah, Joanne. Excellent. Thank All you, right. Joanne. Uh, <laughs> um, I thought that was really good. And what I'd like to do is take it. Oh, 
take it back to our committee meeting. Um, do you yeah. have the slides available? That yeah, what we'll do is we'll we'll send the link um, and uh, certainly we'll send the, the slides out as well for you, okay? Yeah, that's brilliant, thank you. Okay, not a problem. Any other questions? I think that looks like that looks like it. So what I would just like to do is thank you again for attending. Thank you, Kevin, um, for your presentation and thank you, John, as well. Um, just to finish with, as I've said, we, what we want to do is support clubs um, through this process. If you think this is something that you want to, to have further information on, um, you can call the legal helpline through Muckle um, on the number there. And basically, we're, what we're doing is we've, we've worked with Muckle and they'll basically run through almost a checklist, a legal checklist or health check for you, looking at club structures and tax status. So if you want to access that, by all means do so. Um, they can offer a sort of like a consultation for each club. That'll take around 45 minutes to an hour. And you can book those in via the, the helpline there. And they go up to sort of like up till seven o'clock. So the last time um, that one could be booked will be six p.m. Just so so clubs um, can can basically access that. And that could be either a one to one, uh, an individual, or actually you could organise some kind of conference call with your committee as well, um, with the consultant um, and the, the the legal expert at Muckle. So I will just move on to say thank you very much for attending that. I hope you found that useful. Um, we will be getting feedback uh, from you around this because if this is a way in which we can support clubs um, and cascade this kind of information out, um, together with other topics as well, we are more than happy at doing so. Um, I've had a few, as I said, private chats saying people are really interested in this. Um, so obviously there's some interest there. But, and as I said, what we will do is we will uh, be sending this round. We've recorded it. Um, so again, we can circulate it around our county FAs and through our pilot clubs as well. So thank you very much again for everything that you do. And thank you for attending this evening. And have a good evening. Thank you very much. Thank you for tuning in to the FA Football Forum. If you like this episode and you want any more information, please visit thefa.com forward slash clubs and leagues or email clubsprogram at thefa.com. If you want a monthly dose of this content, be sure to search the Grassroots Football Hub on YouTube or find In The Box on your favourite podcast provider. This is the podcast supporting grassroots clubs and leagues be the best places to play and enjoy the game.